book uh, launch even uh, despite the, the COVID regulations. And sadly, our audience can only join us now through the internet. Um, my name is Istvan Kish, and I'm the executive director of the Danube Institute. Um, I will quickly talk about our guests today. Uh, we have two uh, speakers and one actor who's going to uh, read some of the poems from our book, uh, which I have here uh, with me. Um, Uh, our first speaker we are going to be Joat Niemet, who is a founding mem member of the Fidesz Party and a former State Secretary of the Foreign Ministry, and who is currently the Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Hungarian Parliament. Uh, our second speaker is going to be my colleague, uh, John O'Sullivan, who is a former Special Advisor uh, to the British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, and who is currently now the Senior Fellow of the National Review Institute and, of course, uh, our President at the Danube Institute. Uh, lastly, I would also like to welcome uh, Bolas Sirtes, uh, who is going to be our actor for today. Uh, he has more than 20 years um, uh, experience as being an actor, and he has he had great success on both stage and films. Um, I would like to also thank uh, Jula Kodolányi, uh, the editor-in-chief of the Hungarian Review, for making this book happen. Uh, and of course, the editors of uh, the book, uh, first Chilo Berta, who is a professor and the founder of the Irish Studies at the University of Debrecen. And uh, of course, Donald E. Morse, uh, who is a professor emeritus of the Oakland University and who is also an honorary professor of the Debrecen University. Uh, sadly, our editors could not join us today because of their old age and also because of the COVID restrictions, but they are, of course, uh, with us. Um, and sadly, I would, uh, yeah, because we are talking about people who can be with us uh, because of the COVID virus, uh, I would also like to offer my sincere condolences to the family of Geza Search, uh, one of the prominent poets uh, who was in our book as well, and who has sadly just recently passed away uh, because of the virus. He will be most sorely missed. A uh, recent poll conducted here in Hungary by the Hungarian Academy of Sciences for the 100-year anniversary uh, of the Trianon Treaty showed that 94% of Hungarians, so basically almost every Hungarian, thinks that the Treaty of Trianon was unjust and unfair. 85% uh, thinks that it's the greatest tragedy uh, that could happen uh, to Hungary, by 84% uh, agree with the popular sentiment uh, here in Hungary that a Hungarian is a person who feels pain about Trianon. Uh, I think these statistics show clearly uh, that the shadow of Trianon still very much lives with us. Uh, most Hungarians still feel uh, immersed pain and frustration when they think about Trianon. Uh, this, of course, begs two important questions. Uh, one is, uh, why is this? Why, after 100 years, we still have this uh, uh, harsh feelings um, because of Trianon? And also, how can we express these feelings to foreigners? I think there are several reasons uh, that Hungarians could not get over the tragedy of Trianon, uh, just to name a few of them. Uh, one is that uh, we have to be uh, completely honest and say that the treaty was in reality unjust and unfair, uh, and it did not respect the ethnic borders at all. The treaty left 3.3 million Hungarians in the neighboring countries. If you don't can see Kailand, most of these people actually lived uh, near the borders of, the, uh, of New Hungary. So if uh, the decision makers would have looked at uh, not at economic and strategic reasons, uh, the borders could have been uh, drawn much better, and they could have reflected the ethnical situation much better. Today, still more than 2.5 million Hungarians live in these countries. Still, a lot of them live near the border. Uh, if I reflect to the poll which I just read uh, from uh, above, we can see that about one-fifth of the Hungarians still have relatives living in the neighboring countries and about 37% of Hungarians have friends uh, who are Hungarians from abroad. So these connections are still very much living and very much with us. Um, a second reason, I think, is that uh, the basic, basic human rights of these Hungarian minorities were often not respected and sadly are still 
uh, not respected in some of these countries. This was, of course, especially true for the uh, period between the two Second World Wars. Uh, as Father Andrew Linka, uh, the leader of the bigger Slovakian uh, party at the time, the Slovakian People's Party, famously commented in the uh, 20s, uh, let the memory of the Hungarian homeland flicker in our spirits as we never suffered so much under the thousand years of Hungarian rule than under the six years of the Czech rule. Uh, this, of course, shows that these countries sometimes did not respect uh, the minority rights of the Hungarians living there. But, uh, and some of the authors, actually, who are in this volume also live, live through these prosecutions. Uh, one of the poems which we will actually hear today is from the Transylvanian poet Adam Mokoy, uh, who wrote uh, the, uh, the poem One Day We Shall Create in uh, 1958, uh, two years after the 56th revolution in Hungary, and he had to flee Romania because the authorities were really suspicious of Hungarians in the country after the 56th revolution. Uh, but the other mentioned Giza Search also had to flee Romania in the 80s because the Securitate was harassing him. Um, and sadly, even today, we have regular abuses on human rights, uh, even in the European Union. We just have to look at the citizenship law of Slovakia, which, uh, even with the proposed modification, uh, still makes it really hard for Hungarians to have a dual citizenship in Slovakia. But we could, of course, also mention the Ukrainian language law, which restricts Hungarian language education to kindergartens and to the first four years of elementary school. Uh, a last reason which we might say is that under communism, it was really impossible to talk about this topic. Most of the countries who received territory from Hungary uh, were, of course, members of the socialist bloc, and the internationalist nature of communism made it almost impossible to talk about these issues. Uh, a good example is, again, an essay of a book, uh, an essay which is uh, shown in the book written by E. S. Jula at the turn of uh, 77 and 78, who was, of course, one of the influ most influential writers uh, of, of, our, of the 20th, 20th century in Hungary. Illich first published this essay in the Magyar Nemzet, and after it was published, the editor was actually sacked from Magyar Nemzet because of publishing this essay. And... Um, Later on, when, when uh, E. Ish tried to publish this essay in a book, the book was also banned. So even in the late 70s, it was basically impossible to talk about Hungarians living, in a, living abroad or about Trianon. Um, and just to paraphrase uh, one of the editors of the book who also wrote the foreword for the book, uh, Donald uh, Morse, who beautifully put this, uh, in, in the foreword that this has left Hungary not only severely broken in its national wealth and its economic integrity, but also mentally and physiologically damaged. Hungary could uh, only properly start to absorb this trauma after the fall of communism. So because of this, basically our self-reflection only could start in the 90s and our self-healing process uh, was much delayed. Uh, let us now turn to the second question. Uh, I have this vivid memory uh, that at one of our past events about Trianon, one of the British members of the audience uh, compared Trianon to how Britain lost its former colonies after the Second World War. Uh, this is an innocent question coming from this person, uh, and, and he was just really interested that if Britain could accept the loose of India, which was about 70 years ago, then why can Hungary accept Trianon, which was uh, about 100 years ago? Uh, this short example clearly shows how uh, most foreigners can't really understand Trianon, um, even the intellectuals. I mean, uh, of these people might have heard about the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, they might have heard about the First World War, and because of this they think that the Austro-Hungarian Empire was like any other empire. It was like the British Empire, as this uh, person suggested. But this is not true at all. Uh, Transylvania or Upper Hungary were not colonies of Hungary, but they were integral parts of its kingdom since the establishment of the Hungarian kingdom about a thousand years ago. So, uh, of course, Hungarians feel completely different about these uh, lost territories than the British would feel about losing some of their colonies. Uh, as a Hungarian, of course, I always found it difficult to explain this and uh, to explain the pain of Trianon to foreigners. 
Uh, but a lot of people say that culture and poetry is an universal language, and I think that is why this book is really important. Um, this book con contains uh, not political poems, but poems which show that uh, how these Hungarian writers and authors felt about Trianon. And of course, we have a far-ranging uh, Hungarian authors from both the left and the right who uh, have poems in this uh, book. Of course, we have authors from the motherland, but we also have authors from the neighboring countries. So it was really important to include and try to include uh, Hungarian writers from these, from these countries as well, from the Hungarian countries. Of course, we have some of these poems which uh, look at the shock and the disbelief that these people felt after the Treaty of Trianon, but we also have some poems which uh, you know, try to show hope and the, the desire to make the most of the current situation. So we have all of these uh, different kind of poems, but I think what connects these writings is that they give a kind of a glimpse uh, about the complex feelings Hungarians had and still have about Trianon. And I really hope that by reading these poems, foreigners will have a better chance in understanding our feelings about Trianon and uh, also have a better understanding about the whole process itself. So to today, uh, the program will go as the following. Uh, first, I will kindly ask uh, Bolas Sirtes, uh, our actor, who will, recite, who will read a poem. And then, of course, we will have Jort Nemet follow with his uh, speech. Uh, after that, we will have two other uh, verses read, read, uh, read by uh, Bolas, and then we will have John's reflections, and then the end, we will have two other poems. So I would first kind of like to ask Bolas to say the first. <laughs> Gyula Iyés, Homeland in the Heights. A time may come when to remember shall ask more courage than to plan, to claim the past more than the future in seeking a new fatherland. What do I care? My land already holds more than any height or steady. I walk, look around, live, nothing else. I have found a weapon, magic spells. I already share it too, if I come to tell you its nature, this secret home. Murmur a line of Petofi, friend, in a magic circle at once you stand. If this pure land's overrun by invaders, a new Tatar horde or a horde of traders, if our path are twisted and made to squirm, just as when somebody treads on a worm, then speak to yourself with eyes closed. Just speak those words which at one time caused sense drifting people's houses to compose the pattern Hungary rouses. Enraged rivers learned gentleness or defiant cliffs, do not forget this. If we go back, proud-lipped, unscarred, into our fortresses, our secrets. For mere chilling horror cannot chill us. The merely murderous cannot kill us. Weave your bulletproof vest of language right. Declaim our Bergeny into the night. Gather, friend, all you learned to see when you walked in meadows which then were free. All the spoil of hearts and the minds, the minions, in gay disputes with girls for companions. As Noah into the ark brought kinds, bring every example of thought, the minds, the number of yearnings orphaned, Tell, and your dreams menagerie as well. Though for a thousand years to come, like an echo unchallenged, they lie quite dumb, 
Your words shall answer the questioner's wonder, then with the more surprising thunder. Watch then, and take the lesson to heart, which is mute, though it reaches places apart. Clasping my book in close embrace, I look and laugh in my enemy's face. For if I stand nowhere, I still can be at home, at the heart of what I see. Even if there my world is shown like a Fata Morgana upside down. So I remain a messenger here with precious graveyards in my care. If the order to shoot me through my forehead is given, whatever their nests escapes into heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude uh, for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I'm honored. And uh, I would like to uh, address you with a few points. Uh, relating the uh, issue of uh, Trianon in a political context, uh, I would like to express uh, my uh, gratitude uh, for uh, the Danube Institute, and uh, uh, I am very glad that I can be together today with my uh, old friend Jono uh, Sullivan. Uh, this book show, I think, uh, is a, in an essence of uh, what the Danube Institute is about and what uh, the different enterprises, uh, John O'Sullivan Marx, uh, the Hungarian Review, the Danube Institute, are all about. Uh, to make the Hungarian culture known uh, to uh, the international audience. And it's not an easy job, because this culture is basically a, a literary culture. And literature, very difficult to translate, but the most difficult is to get the pearl uh, of the Hungarian culture, uh, poetry, uh, available to an international audience. So congratulations to uh, all those who have participated in the realization of the nation dismembered, the uh, Hungarian poetry and the 1920 treaty of Trianon. Uh, a very famous author, uh, Adam Mokai, uh, uh, we will probably hear about him a lot in the near foreseeable future because he was a re very remarkable person. Uh, he uh, told me before his death, a couple of weeks before his death, that uh, the business card of Hungary is the Hungarian poetry. And uh, I share his view. But unfortunately, until now, it was very difficult to make the Hungarian uh, poetry available to the international audience. And here, uh, the, uh, then the Hungarian Review played a very important role with this volume and the other volume, which is about uh, 1956, which is also equally extremely important. And if I mention the, the name of Adam Mokoy, I would like to mention his uh, uh, life work, the two volume big uh, collection of poetry uh, named uh, the Miracle Stack, which hopefully will be available in the uh, coming near forcible future to broader audience as well. 
But my task today is not a literary one, but a political one. And uh, as the chairman of the Hungarian Parliament Foreign Relations Committee, allow me a few words about Hungary and the uh, uh, Treaty of Trianon. Trianon causes concrete problems even today. Uh, for today's Hungary, Trianon is on the one hand uh, an old historical event, and on the other hand, a source of unresolved problems. When it happened, even the oldest of today were still children, but let us add that in 1990 there were still those who from their youth remembered the uh, promulgation of the Peace Trianon in 1920. I would like to look back to this last 30 years how the Treaty of Trianon is present and has been present in the past decades in the Hungarian public discourse. There are basically three unresolved problems. First, uh, the political and legal status of Hungarians who got to neighboring countries against their will. Just a little example. Uh, today is Ukraine, which has been uh, at least the fourth state formation since Trianon to rule over Hungarian communities living there. Today, Ukraine simply declares that Hungarians will soon, soon not to be able to learn in their Hungarian mother tongue, which they had a right to do so even in Soviet times. This is also a very specific problem stemming from Trianon uh, but being with us in our contemporary life. Secondly, it disturbs the relationship between Hungary and neighboring nations. All of Hungary's present neighbors have received a certain chunk of the territory of our country, historical country, and therefore some of them tend to feel threatened by us even if we do not intend to threaten them at all. They simply feel it sometimes illogical that we do not threaten them. Thirdly, the Trianon borders have divided economically and we can say organically cohesive regions and thus hampered their development, making border regions almost everywhere disadvantaged in the 20th century. Trianon in the Hungarian domestic political life is the first chapter I would like to talk to you uh, to some extent. So, domestic aspects. The dividing line between conservatives and the communists, post-communists is the most uh, relevant one. After the change of regime in 1990, it uh, quickly became clear that there were those for whom the Trianon problems I listed before were not so important. Thus, they formed a common enemy for the generations of conservatives. For example, the prime minister of the second freely elected post-communist government, 1994, Dula Horn, distanced himself from the first conservative government's prime minister, Josef Antal, saying when the latter stated that he considered himself the prime minister of all 15 Millions Hungary, million Hungarians in spirit. Dula Horn stated on the right of his election that he was only the prime minister of 10 million Hungarian citizens. The Tempers were especially irritated when a referendum was held in 2004 on the initiative of a non-governmental organization on the Hungarian citizenship of Hungarians living abroad. The post-communists stated that Hungarians living over the borders just wanted to take jobs away from Hungarians in Hungary. For us, however, on the center-right, it was clear and obvious that this was an, an emotional need on their side and could affect those beyond the borders with the feeling of a psychological nuclear strike if Hungary refused their request. In the end, the outcome was a lose-lose situation for everyone. 
The left felt like a loser because within the votes cast, there was a clear shortage of post-communists uh, campaigning against Hungarians living across the borders. We, the political center-right, because the referendum, though with a small majority, still became invalid, so its outcome did not oblige the state to grant Hungarian citizenship to Hungarians living across the state borders. The psychological trauma of Hungarians over the borders have been healed since then because Fidesz, the present ruling party in Hungary, when came to government in 2010, created the possibility of granting Hungarian citizenship. And of course, Hungarians living over the borders did not take away the jobs of anybody. On the contrary, since the employment data in Hungary has improved significantly. I had to mention all this in order to make it clear that the Trianon issue is not only a historical and not only a foreign policy issue in Hungary, but also marks important domestic political dividing lines as well. However, when I mention domestic politics, I do not mean vote hunt. Trianon is not a matter of domestic politics to win votes. The Hungarian electorate, despite the political parties' different positions and approaches on Trianon, sometimes voted for the left, sometimes for the right. The essence of Trianon as a domestic political issue is that we have 2.53 million people, 30, 25, 30 percent of Hungary's population, around us, who are in a difficult situation in many ways, and that is why these people have expectations of us too. Of course, they also have expectations of the country in which they live, but also of Hungary, from which they hope for support, solidarity, and an absolute protection. The real question of domestic politics is to ignore this expectation or try to meet it as much as possible. That is what our debate with the post-communists was and is about. For the sake of clarity, I need to add one point to the debate with the post-communists. There are many leftists who agree with us on the Trianon issue rather than with the left position. Therefore, despite, despite their left-wing beliefs, they found their political identity with us over the time. For example, the former socialist speaker of the National Assembly, Katalin Sili, also takes part in today's government of work in helping Hungarian communities over the borders. The second dividing line internally is obviously between the moderates and the radicals, the conservatives and the far right. There is also a latent domestic political debate over whether we should hate our neighboring countries because of the Trianon problems or even in parallel with the articulation of our problems rather seek dialogue and even cooperation with them among other things to solve these problems. This is our domestic political debate on Trianon with the far right. In this debate our speculate, spec speculator message or answer is the, uh, uh, the real answer is the hard to express, uh, but the issue of belonging together, the national solidarity. And we have got uh, words, difficult words to identify this, összetartozás in Hungarian, uh, which is very difficult to translate into English. Uh, even the word coherence can be also utilized for this. We have established a monument for uh, 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 belonging to the, together, erected on Kossuth Square on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the peace treaty this summer, in which the eternal flame and the biblical quote from the Old Testament above it proclaim the need for reconciliation with our neighbors. Trianon in the Hungarian intellectual uh, uh, mainstream, a few words about the notion of belonging together. Throughout the whole Trianon debate, the notion of belonging together is an important and I think interesting terminus technicus. Essentially, with this concept, uh, Fides, 
the Hungarian government, put an end to the debate that sought Trianon's place in Hungarian memory politics. Nothing could be further from the spiritual word of the younger generations than another pessimistic national self-mourning Memorial Day. The elderly, on the other hand, emphasized that one of the greatest tragedies in Hungarian history must be remembered. From the thesis and antithesis, the synthesis was born not to remember the tragedy, but while 70, 80, 90, and then 100 years have passed between current borders, the fact that Hungarians across the border still feel spiritually cohesive with Hungary, this is a very important fact. The intention was to celebrate that this is a cultural value that only few nations can boast of. We also wanted to celebrate the fact that in 1956 many agreed to undertake solidarity with Hungary even if they were sentenced to prison and even many to death across the borders. We wanted to celebrate that solidarity played an important role in the collapse and abolishment of communism in Hungary and so on. Therefore, 4th of June, the anniversary of the peace treaty, is not officially declared in Hungary as a Trianon morning day, but the day of national belonging together, a decision dating back to 2010. However, this is only one of the meanings of the notion of belonging together just as it was only one of the consequences of Trianon, undoubtedly the most painful, that three million Hungarians found themselves in a minority position. It is also very important that the neighboring nations, let's name them, Slovaks, Ukrainians, Romanians, Serbs, Croats, Slovenes, Austrians, have been our fellow citizens here in the Central European region for a thousand years even if Trianon has made it difficult to live together for a while. Before and after Trianon, we suffered together from the various occupations and at best resisted them together. This happened before Trianon during the Turkish occupation and then during the Habsburg rule, but also during communism, even though it was already after Trianon. The intellectual thinking started immediately after Trianon that the community of destiny or our common fate, as the Hungarian writer Laszlo Német put it, milk brotherhood was raised on the common breasts on Central European culture. It also uh, uh, such a treasury, a value that cannot fall victim to Trianon. This is another aspect of the notion of belonging together. The essence of the Hungarian mainstream thinking about Trianon is that despite the peace treaty that gave most of our former territory to our neighbors, we still belong together. On the one hand, while the Hungarian community is beyond our borders as Hungarians, and on the other hand, with the uh, neighboring nations as Central Europeans. Finally, uh, let me draw your attention to the Hungarian foreign, foreign policy aspects. In a sense, the roots or starting point of this dual sense of uh, coherence, belonging together, the related mainstream intellectual expectation uh, is Hungarian foreign policy in which the protection of minority rights and the strengthening of the Central European region also play a very central role. This was not entirely spontaneous but the realization of the strategic vision of the first freely elected Prime Minister, Josef Antal, before 1990 uh, elections, he announced that Hungarian foreign policy should focus on three issues. Euro-Atlantic integration, good neighborhood, and the protection of minorities. It is a kind of Hungarian peculiarity that this triple goal system has since been publicly recognized as uh, recognized by all Hungarian governments. Left-wing governments too, they are of course, as the issue of the 2004 referendum showed, uh, rather uh, on this ground in theory. A triple goal, a triple focus has already been put into practice by uh, the government 
of uh, Jozef Antal. But let me uh, draw your attention uh, to uh, some uh, contemporary aspects of this question uh, finally. Hungary uh, in the last decades became the engine, the, mo the, the real uh, uh, motor uh, behind international minority uh, protection norm setting. Uh, international documents like uh, the language charter of the Council of Europe or the uh, framework convention for national minorities or the UN uh, <coughs> General Assembly minority declaration, uh, the Hungarian diplomacy largely contributed to. But Hungary was in the forefront uh, to uh, make in the Lisbon Treaty uh, a decisive uh, component that among the values of the European Union, uh, the minority uh, rights have also been named and I would also like to draw your attention that Hungary is committed to support the civic initiatives in the contemporary European Union frameworks, which might contribute largely to the creation of a, a new European minority protection system. Hungary, along with Czechoslovakia and Poland, has established 30 years ago uh, the Visegrad cooperation, which is uh, the heart of the Central European cooperation, which would not mean, does not mean, that the Three Seas Initiative, the other flagship of uh, the regional cooperation, would be less relevant. They go hand in hand, uh, very well together. And as we all remember, uh, the different bilateral treaties uh, originating back to the Antal First Democratic Government, the Hungarian-Ukrainian or the Hungarian-Slovenian basic treaties, have uh, initiated a process of uh, bilateral cooperation uh, on minority matters with our neighbors. And uh, we, with five out of our seven neighbors, I can tell that we have a settled situation However, uh, at this point, I would like to note that we are not satisfied with this. We would be uh, like uh, to have a situation when we have seven settled relationships among the seven neighbors. Uh, I hope that alone with the Ukraine and alone with Romania, we will be able to uh, create a substantial development uh, in the future in our bilateral relations. And thirdly, since 1990, the Hungarian Europe policy uh, uh, has demonstrated very significant successes. Uh, I need to go back again to Jozsef Antal, who was not ready to stop midway uh, between Comecon and uh, the EU or the Warsaw Pact and NATO, but was very clearly committed to joining EU and NATO, which has been achieved uh, by uh, 1999 and 2004, uh, which was not only uh, in, relation to, to, uh, in relation to the Soviet Union or Russia, but many times we had to struggle uh, with the European mainstream in achieving these results. And how this relates to the Trianon question uh, I would uh, say that uh, protection of minorities, building up a strong Central European co cooperation was fundamental in uh, the Euro-Atlantic integration context as well. Uh, to approach on a moral basis the Trianon Treaty question and a reserved, moderate approach to the uh, consequences of the Trianon Treaty uh, the Hungarian uh, political life has uh, contributed largely uh, to uh, the stability of Europe, and I believe that this has got a long-term effect and influence on those debates which are today about the future of Europe. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you.
Csándor reményik, Atlantis tolls. Like Atlantis, the ancient sunken land, do you hear in the depth Transylvania tolls? The sounds of Sekai villages sunk quietly on the floor of the sea. Hungarian boatmen, listen close if you wander above in the stormy night. In the depth below, Transylvania tolls. Sándor Kányádi, behind God's back. Empty mangers, empty stalls, Christmas here no longer calls. No use waiting for the wise man at the door. The creator's got a lot to do, can't see to all those in the queue. The star of that night is far from here to give much light. We know we must have faith in him, but the evenings are so dim. The lack of loving care leaves us feeling cold and bare. In foresight, O oh Lord, you don't lack, but take a look behind your back. Folks here for a while have been waiting for your smile. Valash, Zolt, Ishvan, um, thank you for being here. Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this book launch. Um, we're here to introduce a book, a book which is itself a paradox because it celebrates a national tragedy, the dismemberment of the Kingdom of Hungary by the international community meeting at the Trianon Conference in Paris 100 years ago celebrated in poetry of both heart and mind, expressing such emotions as grief, loss, indignation, sorrow, and anger. I said celebrate. Is that the right word? No, it isn't. And maybe there isn't a right word. Poetry takes an injustice, an outrage, a cruelty, a misunderstanding, and somehow transmutes that injustice, that misunderstanding, into a work of art that arouses sympathy, soothes hearts because their pain is now understood by others, and perhaps also changes minds and attitudes as well. I don't think there's a single word for all those complex emotional changes, at least not in English, uh, rich though that language is, but perhaps there is such a word in Hungarian. If so, this book is an example of it, and I must begin my remarks by thanking all those responsible for the love, devotion, and cultivated taste they invested in it. There are many who deserve to be thanked, and I can't name them all, but I must obviously start with Chilla Berta and my colleague of seven years, Dula Cardellani, who both made the selection of poems, edited them, and provided all the illuminating notes. Um, then uh, Donald Morse, and Bela Pomegatz, who wrote two powerful essays on the, on the significance of Trianon uh, to the Hungarian people and to Hungarian literature. Thirteen poets uh, um, and translators made translations of the original Hungarian poems, which are always faithful and beautiful translations, and which, in some cases, have given us poetry that competes and challenges the original. And then there are the original poets, some like Andre Aidy, known to the world and even to me, and others known unto God and other persons of taste. There's an afterword from the great 20th century writer, Jula Ilyas, who had a family connection uh, with, with Hungarian Review, and who contributes here an essay that both defends the lost Hungarians and celebrates their language as the comforting tongue of the defeated of the 20th century. At last, but certainly not least, um, I would like to thank our co-publishers, the Boitani Foundation and our publisher, Tamás Desiu. Uh, in his introduction to, this, uh, to these poems, Donald Morse points out 
that there are two great events involving Hungary in the 20th century, Trianon and 1956. Now, everybody knows about 1956. Only Hungarians know about Trianon. Yet both are vital to understanding um, the country and its history. Um, I, until 1986, I was a typical foreigner. I knew about 1956, but I had no idea of Trianon or its significance. Then I had a most revealing meeting. I was a journalist, uh, associate editor of the London Times, and one day the editor asked me to take his place at a lunch arranged by the Foreign Office at which I was to meet a Hungarian uh, diplomat, I think. And the, the, the guest turned out to be a communist apparatchik of the reform variety, and he told me the most interesting things. He gave me a very accurate forecast of what was going to happen in the next 10 years in Hungarian politics. I think it was sincere, but it was certainly accurate. Um, he told me that there would be multi-party elections, uh, that the uh, uh, a democratic, a new democratic government of the centre-right would emerge from them, uh, but the country was in such a difficult state uh, that it would be a suicide mission, and the communists having broken into two, uh, the, those called social democrats would get back into power. That, it was quite an amazing prediction, and, uh, I, and at the end of the meeting I said to him, well, you know, I, I'm grateful as a journalist to get such a a good briefing. And then I said, well, is there something I can do for you in return? Meaning, was there someone I might introduce him to when he, was, uh, he wanted to meet in London? And he said, yes, slightly misunderstanding. He said, would you ask, since you write editorials for the Times, would you write an editorial demanding that the Romanian government um, treat its national minorities, particularly the Hungarian minorities, better? And I said, well, um, of course I'd be happy to do that because a good treatment of national minorities certainly fits into Times editorial policy. Um, but I said, why do you ask me to do this? After all, you know, I'm a, a Western capitalist representative. Why don't you ask your uh, fraternal brethren in the uh, Romanian Communist Party? And he replied to my surprise, oh, they take no, no, no notice of us, but if the West asks for something of this kind, it will probably be delivered, or at least mm, appeased. Uh, I went back and told my editor, and we did in fact get an editorial on those lines not long afterwards. Now, that told me about the importance of Trianon. It was the first mention of it that I'd really had, and I went on to learn a great deal more uh, between then and 2013. But I'm not sure even then I understood what I should have done about Trianon's role in Hungary's national culture. Now, a national culture is the mind and imagination of the people. Their achievements, their failures, their sacrifices and crimes, their losses, their hopes, all refracted through their songs, plays, poems, novels, music, painting, statues, theories, histories, and what Abraham Lincoln called the mystic chords of memory. Hungarian culture is, however, an unusual one in being simultaneously high and popular. Or to be more exact, its popular culture celebrates its high literary and musical culture much more than in most other countries. I haven't taken account, um, but it's my impression that Budapest hosts more statues of poets, novelists, and composers than statues of statesmen and generals. Um, those statues generally evoke either the heroic period of Hungary's um, uh, 19th century struggle for independence or its economic and cultural flowering after the 1867 compromise. That long period of success from then until the First World War had a tragic climax in the 1916 coronation of Karl Habsburg's Karoli IV, King of Hungary, in the ceremony choreographed by the great artist statesman Miklos Banfi under the shadow of a grim, relentless, all too modern war that short, would shortly sweep away dynasty, kingdom, borders, and as the first essay, uh, and the comforting uh, security of traditional authority. Uh, night fell on that war world. For most of the remaining 20th century, Hungary suffered defeats, dismemberment, and occupations. But Trianon in particular, and its costs in human suffering on the 
the, both sides of the borders of the new country produced responses of passionate defiance, sorrow, and regret in poetry and the other arts. As no Hungarian needs to be told, Trinon was the last of the little Versailles conferences that settled the disposition of territory and peoples between existing and new states in Central Europe following the defeat of the Central Powers in the Great War. Hungarians uh, are well aware of this because it deprived the country of two-thirds of its population and territory. And that happened though Hungary had not been the leading power in precipitating that great conflict. Arguments still rage over which country statesmen deserve that obloquy, but it was the nation that suffered the worst and most, un and most unjust calamity at its close. It might be better for Hungarians, it might be more comforting in a way, if Trianon had been deliberately plotted uh, and uh, an intended humiliation on the country. There were, of course, plots and conspiracies galore at the various Versailles conferences, as is made very clear in, Paul Mayle, in historian Paul Mayle's intricately understood account of what happened at Trianon and beforehand. What is also clear, however, that the monstrously unjust treaty imposed on Hungary um, was the result of an absurd storm of disadvantages that its diplomats faced there, although, in fact, really afterwards, because they arrived to have a diktat forced upon them. Um, Paul Mayle makes the following magisterial summing up. However odious the process, Hungarian leadership could scarcely have failed to appreciate that punishment for being on the, long, on the losing side was inevitable, and at least in the rearview mirror of history, it was naive to suppose Wilson's idealistic plan could completely satisfy any of the nations involved. In the first place, the terms are too general and ambiguous. Far too many vested and conflicting interests clamored for attention, and so on. It, it was a tragedy. It was, a, he says rather, it was a travesty. Uh, more than that, it was a tragedy. I would add, a tragedy with no single perpetrator, but instead a multitude of villains, semi-villains, and not so innocent bystanders. In his first introdu in his introductory essay, Donald Morse powerfully underlines the tragic and painful legacies of Trianon, and he takes them two stages further. He first describes how the Hungarian nation experienced its own vivisection on the Trianon table and responded to it with emotions ranging from personal suffering, as families and regions in the historical nation were divided by, from one another, to a deep feeling that such an unjust settlement could not be sustained, and to a bitter desire to reverse the course of history. The second stage of responses to Trianon is the impulse of poets and other writers to express their own and their nation's feelings of loss and pain. The midpoint, excuse me. Thank you. Um, the midpoint of Morse's essay is this sentence. The Irish writer, Tom McIntyre, wants to find a writer as someone who has been hurt by life and lived to sing about it. A definition that applies all too aptly to generations of post-1920 Hungarian writers who have never forgotten and can never forget the pain inflicted on their country by the Trianon Treaty. As the book demonstrates on every page, Hungarian poets did not forget this pain, though pains equally great and mostly unmerited were poured on top of them as the century ground mercilessly on. Well into the 1980s, the nation's greatest writers were envisaging the Hungarian nation as a wounded and imprisoned one. They saw the spiritual liberty in their beautiful language, which thus became the language for them of all those others constrained by history and injustice. Moore cites the famous hymn-like poem, A Wreath by Julia Ilias, that conveys the deep love, respect, and loyalty they had to the mother tongue. I quote briefly, I couldn't compete with my colleague. Uh, language of fertile smiles, of bright tears shared in secret, language of loyalty, lingo, lingo of never surrendered faith, password of hope, language of freedom, briefly snatched freedom, behind the prison guard's back freedom. In that very modern poem, 
Ilyas proudly identifies his mother tongue as a language of the losers and victims of the terrible low points um, of the 20th century. When I turn to the politics of Trianon today, I am, will restrain myself to two general principles which I think the poets should encourage us to feel. Not simply the poets, obviously, but particularly um, people who exist to give us spiritual guidance and political wisdom. The first is, we should never forget Trianon or its many victims, but we should not nourish grievances either, especially grievances that hope to reverse history but offer no way of doing so. That is an obligation on everybody, but particularly in this case on Hungarians. But obligations are reciprocal, and others have obligations too. The obligation of others is to create their country with as little injustice as possible so that they can rightly ask for loyalty from citizens placed in their sovereignty without asking, um, with, and, but, sorry, without asking that they surrender their souls as well. And language is one of the aspects of the soul. Having said, given those two general principles, I in a sense, have, I will yield the floor every day <laughs> to Zolt Nemeth, who gave us a moment ago an insight into the kind of policies that can fulfill and meet those obligations. Uh, policies which were both realistic and optimistic, creative and generous-hearted. I hope the publication of this book will make his task and that of his diplomat diplomatic and political partners an easier and more hopeful one. And that is why I urge them and you to read the book. Thank you. Istvan Ferences. Echoes to the Blues. Ladies and gentlemen, the man in whose blood they pen for gold, Louis Armstrong now sings for you. Homeless in my homeland, I'm a livid spot on my country. It's me, the dirt is calm. It's me, the blood spat on snow. It's me, the dark billiard ball. It's me, the second-hand burial suit. It's me, the 20th century black pine box. It's me, the lump of coal thrown in the fire. A homeless, livid spot. The holy accession of liberty. That's me, the worn-out record. That's me, the suit-stained glass held up to the solar eclipse. That's me, the shadow of graveyards. That's me. A livid spot on my homeland, homeless in my homeland, in whose blood they pant for gold, ladies and gentlemen, the man with the golden horn, Louis Armstrong, sang for you. In the name of the Hungarian Review and the Danube Institute, I would like to thank our audience for joining us uh, today. And of course, I would like to thank uh, our panelists, uh, Joel Nemet, uh, John O'Sullivan, and of course, our terrific uh, actor, uh, Balázs Sirtes. Uh, I think we had a really uh, moving uh, discussion, especially uh, because of the poems which were read, but also I think we had really interesting uh, contributions from our two speakers. So thank you, and um, I would like to also announce that on Monday we will have another book launch, uh, which is also published by the Hungarian Review, uh, and a bit similar to this book, because that's also a book of poems, uh, but about the 56th revolution. So please join us on that event as well. Thank you. <laughs>